I'll tell you a dirty little secret about that book. Um, people think it's about a TV writer gone bad, basically. It was a tiny, tiny part of my life. A lot of the book was about committing like ridiculously dumb crimes in downtown LA, living in your car, you know, all this other kind of junky adjacent madness. But the publisher, I came to realize when it came time to edit it down, they said, you know, first of all, it's like a thousand pages. So they basically cut out the non-Hollywood stuff. So it ended up being looking like that, which is fine. You know, it worked out the way it worked out, but uh, no complaints there. But it's it's always uh, bittersweet because people see it as this uh, sort of Hollywood memoir when it was so, so far from Hollywood. It's the, it's the L.A. nobody even sees because it's like downtown and Skid Row and, you know, that whole region. So uh, if you're asking what it was like to write it, imagine if you just have to give, you got to lean over the abyss as far as you can without falling in. You know, that's what it was like for me, you know, because I get clean, I get this book deal and it's, you'd think that quote unquote, getting your dream come true would fix you. But in fact, in my case, and I think a lot of people can relate sometimes when you get that thing, you think you wanted, and you feel just as empty and you still have this kind of hole inside your heart, you know, that's a terrifying place. And that informed the book to some extent. Well, I was desperately struggling to stay clean as I wrote the book about getting high. So the process of doing that was very dangerous. And, uh, Eventually, you know, uh, I relapsed again, you know, and uh, it was it was a juggling act because I'm trying not to die writing a book about being clean after I just relapsed, you know, towards the end. And it, it was just a crazy, very psychically charged time because, you know, for me, the way I would describe writing back then is you're up on a high wire. And heroin lets you forget there's no net, you know, so you can just do what you want to do. But take away the heroin, then you got to have some kind of faith that it's going to be all right no matter what happens. I didn't always have that faith. It took me a minute to get there. And uh, so that was the struggle. I had six unpublished novels before that book. Um, still out there, you know, I'd get the first chapter published as, as a short story in some literary magazine, uh, or Playboy was very kind to me. I published a couple of stories there, which used to publish great fiction, I believe it. He said defensively. Um, and, uh, I never wrote an honest word. I think the difference is I use language to hide the truth about who I was. And I finally hit a place when I got to this book, which started as a magazine article, which they cleverly entitled Naked Brunch oof, in, a, in a magazine called L.A. Style. And it was the first time it's like, fuck it. I'm just going to be real. I wasn't trying to make it literary, quote unquote. It was just it just poured out of me like lava for better or worse. And it was a whole new way to write and ultimately a whole new way to live. And that that's the difference. Um, but seeing it on screen, yeah, I'm sure you can. I'm sure there's a couple things in your life, you know, you might not want broadcast. But I didn't care anymore. You know, for me, it was, it was, it was like, all right, fuck it. This is this is who and what I am. And the amazing thing, you think you're being so extreme and saying all this crazy stuff, and then I I, I go on a book tour and I and I'll talk to a cameraman. And say, yeah, that happened to me. You know. I got caught shooting up in my neck and, you know, with like uh, Arby's or something. You know, everybody's secrets are the same. That's what I learned. I had six unpublished novels before that book. Um, still out there, you know, I'd get the first chapter published as, as a short story in some literary magazine uh, or Playboy was very kind to me. I published a couple of stories there, which used to publish great fiction, believe it. He said defensively. Um, and uh, I never wrote an honest word. I think the difference is I use language to hide the truth about who I was. And I finally hit a place 
when I got to this book, which started as a magazine article, which they cleverly entitled Naked Brunch oof, in, a, in a magazine called L.A. Style. And it was the first time it's like, fuck it. I'm just going to be real. I wasn't trying to make it literary, quote unquote. It was just it just poured out of me like lava for better or worse. And it was a whole new way to write and ultimately a whole new way to live. And that that's the difference. Um, but seeing it on screen, yeah, I'm sure you can. I'm sure there's a couple things in your life. You know, you might not want broadcast, but I didn't care anymore. You know, for me, it was it was, it was like, all right, fuck it. This is this is who and what I am. And the amazing thing, you think you're being so extreme and saying all this crazy stuff. And then I, I, I go on a book tour and, I, and I'll talk to a cameraman. So, yeah, that happened to me. You know, I got caught shooting up in my neck, and, you know, with like uh, Arby's or something. You know, everybody's secrets are the same. That's what I learned. You would then uh, go into fiction in the sense of you mentioned novels written, but with Purple Love Story. Great story. Um, what was exciting about being able to, to at this point now, go into that realm and, and, and with any, and was this an earlier book that you refashioned into something that was, no, there? no, this brand, brand new book. Yeah. Uh, my earlier books just, I left them on the, left them on the field, so to speak, you know, with brand new book and a written completely it was the first book, you know, completely clean, nothing, you know, uh, which I only mentioned because it's, a, a, it's a truth that Hubert Selby, who was like a mentor told me, I remember saying to him, hey, man, you know, I don't want to give everything up because of the booze and the drugs, you know, I'll lose my edge. And he said, he looked at me and he just cackled, you know, he was this little wonderful guy from Brooklyn, you know, real badass. And uh, he said, you dumb motherfucker, you don't know how crazy you are until you're off of everything. And uh, I think my subsequent career, such as it is, has uh, proved that true, you know? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for your candor. Um, where in the world did you come up with such a great premise that two crackheads would steal a picture of George W. Bush's, uh, and then, and then kick off everything from there? Was that an original, just a thought you batted around? It was a bizarre original thought. There was this guy, my a good friend of mine who died recently, Stuart Kornfeld, amazing Hollywood guy. He used to uh, run Mel Brooks's company. Then he ran Ben Stiller's. And he told me this bizarre story about something called the bio brain. Because, you know, when you're a little kid, you take your balls and you go like this, and it looks like a big bio brain. It's like, I never did that, but thank you for that image, you know. And then somehow I hated Bush so much. I just thought, what is the best thing? Yeah, I wanted to write kind of a noir with like, you know, where you're looking for something. But instead of a Maltese Falcon, it was uh, W's Nutsack. Norman Mailer once described writing a novel like driving at night. You, may, you probably heard this, but he said you see 20 feet ahead in your headlights. And then when you get there, you see the next 20 feet. And that's how I write. I just I have a first sentence. I know where I want to go. Kind of know where I want to end up. Sometimes I have a last sentence and then just go, man. And you just have to trust that it's going to it will find its shape. I mean, you're, you're a permanent midnight fan for that book. I, I got about. 50 little stories, printed them up and put them all down like mosaics on the carpet and then just arranged them. My most recent book, it actually comes out in paperback, April 2nd, 999, One Man's Tale of Depression, Psychic Torment, and a Bus Tour of the Holocaust. Because you want a catchy subtitle. And uh, what inspired that? I was so depressed. Your depression runs in my family. You know, my old man, suicide, mother, attempted, you know, all that. It's just some families, you know, unibrows. Well, my family has unibrows too, but uh, some families have suicides. We had suicides. So very depressed. And uh, I thought, what is the one place on earth where it is absolutely appropriate to be just down to the bottom of your shoes, depressed and concentration camp. So I got Vice Magazine to send me to do a six part series. And I went to Auschwitz, Buchenwald and Dachau. But in that series, they didn't want anything personal. They just wanted to talk about the camps, which was fine. But for the book, I got to do the real deep excavation. And uh, 
sort of narcissistically make it about what it feels like to go through that. And people say, oh, you wrote a funny book about the Holocaust. It's like, that's exactly the opposite of what I did. The humor for me, and it's very dark humor, comes from the fact that you come staggering out of the gas chamber at Auschwitz, and the first thing you see are people just hammering uh, Fantas, shoving pizzas in their mouth, and having a snack. Because that's when you want a snack, you know, when you've come out of the gas chamber. And that just blew the back of my head off. And that single detail is the germ for what that book ultimately was. It was about the absolute peculiarity of people honeymooning in Dachau.